We're going to continue with um, a panel with the title Compass 89, and um, Kyle Schlögel will be on it, as well as Carolina Vigura. Sadly, Ilgo Sasha Kowalczuk couldn't make it because, uh, for technical reasons, um, we're very sad about this, but uh, we'll, we'll have the panel shortly, and Rika Kingapap will moderate and will introduce the panelists to you. But before, we would like to show you something, um, a short movie, um, which, which was shot in um, Leipzig, 1989, in October. And I'm, I'm sure some of you have seen it before, but maybe you don't know all the background. So I will, I will say something about it. And it kind of um, relates to what Grünbein, Dos Grünbein said yesterday about the immediate experience of the early 89 demonstrations. And the footage that we're about to see um, we can only watch thanks to Siegbert Schäfke, a journalist here in Germany, and Adam Radomski. And these two snuck up a church tower uh, on the night um, in early October in central Leipzig, and they secretly filmed the mass protests that were about to form uh, down, down below them. And I quote um, Siegbert Schäfke. He says, the first shot is when I was filming down from the church tower with my friend Aram Randomsky and the estimated 70,000 came towards us. And how powerful 70,000 people can shout, no violence, join us, we are not hooligans. People hear the signals, human law, allow new forum, Gorby, Gorbachev, Gorbachev. And um, Already on this day, Shevka was sure that, and I quote him again, once this footage gets aired in West Germany television, it will not only change the GDR in West Germany, but also Europe and the rest of the world. And he was right. They managed to smuggle the footage to colleagues in West Germany. It was shown in Western German television, and in turn, um, East German citizens could watch it. Um, and in turn, they, the East Germans dared to publicly express their discontent and join street protests. And to make it short, the rest, the rest of it is, is mostly history. So you, you know it and we'll discuss it. But I would like to show you and, and, and watch this movie. And afterwards, we'll go straight to the panel. Thank you.
we were, I guess, a bit taken away with what we, you know, if it is uh, powerful to watch, so we hesitated for a moment whether we should come immediately, or at least I did. But here we are. So thank you for coming back after such a short coffee break. I promise you're going to have time to discuss all the things heard before, both with uh, Karl Schlögel and Carolina Vig, who are sitting beside me here on the stage, and among each other um, during the lunch break. But let me then briefly introduce them. Karl Schlögel has already been introduced, a historian and writer, professor emeritus. Um, Carolina Vigura although uh, is a member of the Eurozine Network here as uh, a board member of Cultura Liberana Foundation, uh, one of our partner journals being Cultura Liberana. She's also assistant professor at the Warsaw University's Institute of Sociology. And the only reason I'm reading this is because I don't remember long institutional names. I'm sorry for that, or numbers for that matter. She's a sociologist, historian of ideas, and a journalist. And she's this year a visiting fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Berlin. So we have the luxury of having her now. Very welcome to the Thank both you of so you. Thank you so much for having me. Please do start to collect your remarks and questions because we plan to, or at least I plan to, open up the floor very soon for both remarks and questions. Uh, we want to do it um, rather democratically. So upon Karl Schlöger's suggestion, instead of starting with a big address, given that Ilko Sacha Kovalchuk unfortunately didn't make it to this talk, he was supposed to be with us today, he's very sorry. Um, we rather start with discussing uh, a bit more personally. So who was where and what were you in 89? or let's say 89.91, which is uh, up for grabs as well. Should I start? You're looking at me. Oh, for all sorts of reasons. Mm -hmm. I've seen Karl Schlögen now for quite a while up there. In 1999, I was nine. I don't remember what I was doing. I remember what I was doing a year afterwards when the first Polish free presidential elections were taking place, and I remember I was jumping. And uh, namely, I was jumping on the carpet of my parents' living room when they, where they were watching television and they were watching the results. So this is the political initiation basically I had, uh, being extremely um, uh, happy, uh, delighted with the, with the, uh, with the um, information that Lech Wałęsa just became the president of Poland. And I do believe that this is actually the initiation that my generation had. It's not only my private story. It's a story about, of the generation. And, and you know, and I, I keep thinking that, you know, we, we keep repeating 1989, 1989, and I keep thinking, um, you know, 1989, we shouldn't actually be talking about a moment. We should be talking about the process. 1989 is a process, and and perhaps what I what, what I think happened later with me also is uh, just a set of paradoxes. So um, it's it's really like in this beautiful uh, bu book uh, by Charles uh, Dickens, where he, he writes at the beginning of the tale of two cities that it was the best of times. It was the, it was the worst of times. Yes? It was the source of Hope, it was a, a winter of despair. It was the source of light and of darkness. And I do believe that this is exactly what has been happening after 1989. But I will come back to that later. Yeah, but you just embarrassed me because you reminded me it's not a moment, it's, it's a process. But you were down for the idea to talk about how, where you were in 89. So now I look like a fool for asking that. It's not kind. Mr. Schlögel, we know how you felt when Perestroika broke. It's, it's not the appropriate word, broke, but how, how did you, how, how do you recall yourself on a personal level yeah. in 89 or on the 89-91 continuum, wherever you choose? If you allow me to switch to German, so I feel easier. It's, is it okay? Uh, in 89, I lived at the end of West Berlin, in Kreuzberg, uh, direct on the Mauer, and I saw the Nachricht with Schabowski and was erstaunt und es kam dann 
Es ging dann los, die Leute kamen über die Oberbaumbrücke und es war eine fassungslos äh, großartige, aber eigentlich fassungslose Stimmung. Und äh, ich ging dann von dort äh, zu Checkpoint Charlie und später zum Brandenburger Tor, wo wir alle auf die Mauer kletterten und, äh, uns, und uns selbst bestaunten. Es war eine große, ja, ein großes Ereignis, sozusagen in dieser Geschichte <lacht> dabei zu sein. Aber mein Punkt ist ähm, eigentlich, ich hatte das schon gesagt, äh, die Mauer, äh, sie hat mich auch überrascht, dass sie runtergekommen ist, aber sie war nicht unerwartet. Äh, ich hatte ja 86 ein Buch geschrieben, äh, die Mitte liegt ostwärts, wo eigentlich die, sozusagen die Erosion und das, wo bereits etwas anderes auftauchte, dass es ein Europa jenseits dieser Ost-West-Teilung gibt. Und ich muss noch etwas sagen, was äh, gestern zum Beispiel auch zu kurz gekommen ist. Äh, mein äh, Europabild oder die neue Erfahrung war nicht nur 89. Also ich hatte in meinem Leben zwei glückliche äh, historische Erfahrungen. Das eine war 68 und das andere war 89. Ja, beschenkt mit zwei solchen Ereignissen. Und 68, das war ein Studium hier an der FU in Berlin. Und es war auch Prag. Ich war in Prag in, in 68. Und, äh, und diese sozusagen Doppelerfahrung, äh, das ist äh, etwas, äh, ja, worüber, äh, also was jedenfalls in meinem Gehirn eingebrannt ist. Und die Haupt, der Hauptschock eigentlich, wo ich merkte, dass etwas Ungeheures und anderes passiert, das war tatsächlich in äh, 86, 85, 86, 87. Äh, ich arbeitete in Moskau, meine Familie war dort. Und ähm, es war einfach ungeheuer, äh, dass der Fernseher, äh, dass die ganzen Routinen, äh, man konnte ja die Zeitung nicht mehr lesen, äh, äh, mit einem Schlag äh, wurde es wie ein, einem elektrischen Schlag, veränderte sich alles. Es gab jeden Abend Nachrichten, auf die man nicht gefasst war. Also es wurde irgendwo ein Grab ausgegraben mit den Überlebenden, von, äh, von, mit den Überresten von, äh, von Erschießungen. Es gab einen, man konnte beobachten, wie die, diese Routinen, diese Funktionäre ins Stottern kamen ja, und wie sie plötzlich versuchten, sozusagen sich frei zu machen und eine neue Sprache äh, zu finden versuchten. Man wurde Teilhaber an, an einer Diskussion in, in, in öffentlichen Räumen. Und ich muss sagen, die, die Inbesitznahme der Stadt dann im Laufe von Demonstrationen und, und äh, es war einfach großartig und insofern hat eigentlich mein Mauerfall hat vorher stattgefunden. Und noch etwas, was sehr wichtig war, im Frühjahr 89 gab es ein Ereignis, ich habe darüber auch in der FAZ geschrieben, über den Polenmarkt. Es gab im Frühjahr 89 den Polenmarkt, für mich war das auch schon der Fall der Mauer. Es kam samstags früh mit den Zügen aus Krakau, Katowice, Wrocław, Posen, kamen Tausende von Polen an, die auf diesen Markt an der Philharmonie und an der Staatsbibliothek gingen. Und die Grenze der DDR hat einfach kapituliert. Sie winkte eigentlich die, die Besucher dieses, dieses Marktes, des Polenmarkts, des Bazars, durch. Und für mich war eigentlich der, der Polenmarkt, ja, das war eigentlich schon die Rückholung Westberlins sozusagen in den europäischen Kontext, das Ende der, der Inselexistenz und diese, diese elementaren Vorgänge, also gar nicht die oberen Entscheidungen, sondern diese elementaren Vorgänge sind für mich eigentlich viel, viel entscheidender gewesen. Thanks to the Polish Bazaar, I have to say. Now I have to act as if I fully understood all you said, which I will try to fake. Uh, I hope I did, but please correct me if I misunderstood you, because my German is most tailored for butcher shops, uh, unfortunately. Uh, I have to say, Zatainz was very entertaining up until the age of five, but then we got Cartoon Network, so I rather learned English instead of German, but this is only because that was for free. So... Um, Eastern European experiences, big time. Uh, nobody asked me, actually, but I'm going to tell you what I remember from, from 89. I don't remember anything from 89, more or less, apart from, you know, cocoa in the morning or something. 
But I do remember uh, my grandfather having intimate uh, conversations with that bronze statue of Lenin, which then after a while disappeared. It would be spilt over with red paint for, for on certain mornings when we were going to kindergarten. And then he would just stand there and say, oh, they'll clean you up, all right. Like talking to an, an old, disgusting friend. And then another thing I remember, and for Hungarians, if you ask them, it wouldn't necessarily be 89, it would be 90 that they name as uh, the year of the Rendszerváltás, which is system change, literally. Um, what I do remember very intensively is uh, being over at my cousin's house and the parents opening champagne and some weird sounds that they're watching TV. And uh, I don't remember when it was. I never actually checked after. But we run there and my mother would explain that this was the Ceausescu execution. Thank you. And... Uh, we would be frightened, obviously. And I would try to ask her what the hell that meant. And I was five, so I didn't have ish, five-ish. So I didn't have much information. And then she would try to explain the ambiguity of not rooting for execution, but neither for Ceausescu, and trying to explain what our neighbors, close neighbors, and some family members, and you know, close contacts of ours, um, across the border, which is pretty close, might be feeling right now, and the kind of relief that they were feeling then, which, uh, which was a weird ambiguity, which, which followed through, and I think in these societies remained pretty much present. Um, Carolina uh, mentions that, that this is, uh, this is um, sort of initial experience in your socialization, that there's this huge moment of well, if not victory, at least progress, right? Or how, how would you name it? Would you name it victory? Or would you name it liberation? Or what would your, your uh, word for this experience be, for the process that you felt or sensed starting? Yes, I, I have been ruminating here about um, the fact that you said that, that, that I, I pr stressed it was a process, although I was saying first that I would like to talk about the personal experience this and I just but I want to, what I wanted to actually to 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 give a thought to this why is this that we like so much to come back with our memory to a certain moment like 1989 or 1968 or 9/11 uh, for that matter why is it um, and is it it is it is it not that we are actually we like to come back with our memories because this tells us very something very important about us. But I would um, I would perhaps said, um, try to try to argue that only if we see a process, then we can actually be um, believe that we can still change the situation, that we have actually influence on the situation. Why? Because when I, when I listen now to many comments about what has happened in Poland in 2015, what, ha what happened in the US in, in 2016, it's again we are talking about a point in history, about a moment, again. And not about all the various factors that actually brought us here, for example. Yes? So, um, so, so th this, is, this is puzzling, I must uh, say, this tension between our pleasure in reminding ourselves what happened at a particular moment and the process. And I wanted to, 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 to say a few, a few things about the process now. Um, so I do believe that this process of 1989, um, this 30 years, this has been a 30 years of paradoxes. And the first would be this. Um, you... Many of you probably remember the film Matrix. In Matrix, there is this Morpheus guy who explains everything to the to Neo character. And at one point, Neo has a déjà vu. What does the Morpheus say? Do you remember? He says, yes, he says, it is so something being changed in the system. So this is extremely interesting for my personal experience. 
In the past few years, I have been living in, in Poland, in the UK, and now in Germany. And whenever I come, there is the same process going on. The process, namely, that a country, a given country, is celebrating a very important anniversary, like the 25th anniversary of the democratic breakthrough I observed in Poland. Everybody spoke what a success it was, the, the transformation. And then a year after, law and justice wins the elections, saying Poland is in ruins. And then I go to the UK and I observe exactly the same process there uh, during the Brexit uh, d discussion. And then I come here and the 30th uh, anniversary of the fall of the, of the wall is being uh, celebrated at, at the same time there is the election in Turingen. And with, you know, how, how, how big success it was for the AfD. So it is really that... Every time we become too optimistic about the, the, the results of 1989, we are being chased by history itself. Yeah, but isn't it the case that in, on anniversaries you have to be hopeful, like on birthdays you have to be kind to the celebrity, even though they just brought an F home? I mean, I expect my family to be friendly with me, but I don't think it's just. Um, and this is, I have this experience personally, I can relate very closely. This is why I was very reluctant when we first started to talk about our focal point, which turned out to be amazing, which credit goes to Ferenc Lotso and, and Luka Lysiak um, for that. I was reluctant because I was very scared that now we are going to have to celebrate something just because it's a round anniversary. And on those times, we act as if we liked each other, right? <laughs> But um, but apart from this personal sensation, isn't it resonating, though, with what Mr. Schlugel has said about history being sort of, and I'm very wildly, widely interpreting what you said, being read on over the head of people and expected of them to learn instead of drawing the consequences for the current day. Also, also saying that the new Europe did not start in 89. This was a process much longer than this. And, you know, at least dating back to perestroika, but more truly speaking, this division of time, this, this close cesura in time between the Cold War and everything else to follow seems quite as artificial as the Iron Curtain itself, in a sense. So, okay, that being said, what the hell do we do with this anniversary then? So what's, apart from having a conference and, and discussing this um, rightfully with people who have a, cl a deeper understanding, what's the use of bringing up these memories? What's the use of bringing up our personal memories? Mr. Schlögel, what does it move in you or what, do you, what use do you see to it right now? Jahrestage sind ja eine gute Sache. Man muss sich darüber ja nicht ironisch äußern. Sie finden statt und ich habe dieses Programm für diese ganze Woche mir angesehen. Das ist unglaublich, was hier alles an interessanten Sachen läuft. Die Frage ist nur, ob sozusagen das Fest gelassen begangen wird oder ob es an die Stelle von etwas tritt, ob es Ersatz für etwas ist. Und das hat Guy Debord mit seinen, mit seinen Untersuchungen ja versucht klarzumachen, dass da eine Gefahr besteht bei solchen Festen. Aber ich bin, also ich genieße Feste auch, aber ich bin eigentlich an anderen Dingen interessiert. Mein Ideal, meine Idealfigur für soziologisches und sonstiges Analysieren und Beobachten ist eigentlich der Indianer, wenn man das heute noch so sagen darf, der Indianer, der auf der Erde liegt, sein Ohr auf die Erde legt und hört, wie die Bisonherde oder der Zug heranstürmt. Das heißt, mich interessiert eigentlich herauszufinden, wie lange Prozesse laufen. Und das ist eine vollständig andere Matrix, die nichts zu tun hat mit Zäsuren, klar geschnittenen Grenzen und so weiter. Und es war vollständig klar, 
dass lange vor 89 dieser Ostblock als diese kompakte, homogene Entität existiert er überhaupt nicht. Das ist ja, er existiert, aber er existiert gleichzeitig nicht. Die Verhältnisse in Prag waren ganz andere als in, 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 in der Ukraine damals oder in, in Polen. Jedes Land tickte bereits ganz anders. Und es ist das große Verdienst, muss man wirklich sagen, dieser denkenden Köpfe, also die Leute aus der Lukacs-Schule, äh, Konrad und Fehr und äh, Heller und äh, natürlich den, äh, den Warschauern, sie haben schon ein Gefühl und eine, einen Sinn und ein Auge äh, gehabt für die Änderungen, die kommen. Und deswegen war dieses äh, 89 oder 90 dann überraschend, aber auch long expected. Es war lange schon in, in, in Vorbereitung. Und die Frage ist für mich auch äh, dann in den 90ern gewesen, wie findet man eine analytische Matrix, in der ein drunter und drüber sozusagen analytisch erfasst werden kann. Also ich äh, bezeichne mich als Phänologen. Und das heißt, man musste äh, komplett widersprüchliche Dinge, äh, die zusammenkommen, erfassen. Also das Überraschungsmoment und die lange Zeit. Ja, also ich hatte jetzt in Kiew auch wieder ein Erlebnis, wo man das auch beobachten konnte. Mir wurde mein Pass und alles geklaut und ich war dann bei der Polizei. Und ich war in einem sowjetischen Polizeioffice, äh, ja, also mit Resopal und äh, äh, mit einem Buch und mit Protokollen und so weiter. Aber gleichzeitig hat dieser junge Mann, dieser Sergeant, wollte alles super korrekt machen, weil die neue Zeit alles super korrekt machen will. Ja, nichts mit Bestechung, nichts mit einem Dollar geben für Beschleunigung des Verfahrens. Sodass in dieser Situation von diesen zwei Stunden kam die lange Tradition sozusagen der sowjetischen Miliz zum Tragen, also diese ganze Umständlichkeit und so weiter und der bürokratische Kafkaeske Betrieb, und gleichzeitig der Wille, es ganz anders zu machen. Und wie das gehen soll, also die lange, schwere, schwerfällige Zeit und der schnelle Wandel, wie das zusammenkommt. Und ich könnte tausend äh, Bilder äh, bringen, wo das gemacht worden ist. Also wo äh, die ungeheure Initiative, die die Leute entfaltet haben. Also ich war immer ein Bewunderer dieser Basar-Leute, also diese Millionen von Leuten, äh, die in ganz Osteuropa unterwegs waren, und die das Land oder den Kontinent eigentlich zusammengehalten haben. Ja, also diese Tschilnoczniki, die äh, zwischen Istanbul und Minsk und äh, zwischen Lodz und, äh, und äh, Rom hin und her gefahren sind. Äh, diese, die Arbeit dieser Unsichtbaren, äh, das ist eigentlich das Faszinierende. Und ich würde auch sagen, heute, wir gucken jetzt immer auf diese auf diese Brüssel-Ebene und auf die Parlamentsebene. Und das ist alles wichtig. Aber dass eigentlich dieser Kontinent irgendwie doch äh, zusammenhält, auf eine ganz widersprüchliche Weise. Also, äh, Sie können zum Flughafen gehen und nach Lemberg fliegen, eine Stunde. Äh, diese Flieger sind alle voll von Leuten, die hin und her fliegen. Ja? Und äh, das ist für mich äh, eine Europäisierung in einem ganz elementaren Sinn. Und ich würde sagen, man kann über Europa und die Chancen Europas überhaupt nicht sprechen, wenn man nicht diese Kriegsströme, diese, diese Bewegungen, diese elementaren Bewegungen nicht in Rechnung stellt. Also mein Plädoyer ist auch sozusagen die Matrix der Analyse zu ändern, die nicht ignoriert, dass es sozusagen Top-Oligarchen gibt, dass es dort einen Mann gibt, der ein Verhängnis ist, der äh, schlimme Dinge tut, aber dass man sozusagen die, die, die analytische, äh, den analytischen Rahmen weitet und, äh, und guckt, wo, wo etwas ist. Und es passiert immer viel mehr als sozusagen in einem bestimmten äh, Ausschnitt. Also die Änderung der analytischen Matrix, das wäre mein Plädoyer. But that does, in quite a sense, uh, remind me of both of your points, that it's not about a, a history of, of grand events. It's not about the history of acknowledged political decisions or the borders vanishing 
without oftentimes an official decision, just think of actually the Berlin Wall, which was basically at least in part a result of the miscommunication that people acknowledge that it's going to be open now, uh, which is, I think, a, a large portion of this history also relatively under-discussed. Um, but it is, in a large part, um, a responsibility to build up this history, even if we say that we don't believe in the circularity. The circularity is supposedly only used to replace a certain teleology. Now we don't say that there is an endpoint that we are progressing towards. Now we say that now we're going in circles. This is just another kind of, um, let's say, fashion of thinking for now, basically replacing an old kind of thinking with an even older one. But then again, if we don't, don't even, even if we don't think this, there lies a certain responsibility of codifying this, digging this up and codifying this in, in a certain version, let's say in public education. And Carolina, you have mentioned this earlier when we were talking before, um, that, that 89 in quite a sense for, for for your generation and for Polish uh, people was both a very, very long year and a year which just disappeared. Would you care to detail that? Yes, it's another paradox. Um, it is indeed a year that lasted the, long, the longest and at the same time, it is a year that wasn't there at all. Um, lasted the longest. Um, I will talk about specifically about Poland now, okay? Um, lasted the longest because in 1989, you can say that Solidarity, Solidarność, won uh, the battle. Uh, they really won the battle in the meaning that their narration, their thinking about where Poland should head to, um, dominated uh, Poland's politics. But with time, it was ever more visible that the uni unity of Solidarity Camp was a, a strategic unity, but it wasn't a true unity. It became more and more divide, divided during the, the following decades. Um, and to some extent, in its degenerated form, it took the form from 1989, when we always thought that there is us, the good people, and them, the occupants. So um, when Civic Platform, Donald Tusk's party, had the, the government for eight years, law and justice would suggest, or even always more openly say, they were the occupants, or at least they were traitors, and Brussels is actually a new Moscow, etc., etc., etc. And now, when 2015 came and law and justice won the elections, it's the liberal conservatives who actually claim the same. That, uh, that, um, that law and justice is a totalitarian party. It's actually the same as the communist party from before 1989. So, and Moscow is a new Moscow. For younger generations, yes. And then of course, Moscow is a new Moscow and it's hidden. And it's a hidden partner of, of, of the law and justice government because law and justice government is eager to criticize Berlin and not Moscow. We can go in detail into that later. But what is amazingly interesting about the new generations, and this is called an intergenerational discussion, or am I right? Um, I mean, because, you know, um, I, I, there should be a 20-year-old sitting here with us. Yeah, I mean, we've been trying. I mean, the long, longevity of, of the generations now is, is really a paradox, too. I mean, I'm not young anymore. I'm 40. Um, so, so um, but OK. But the younger generations, Sorry, the say. only solace I can offer is that we are going to have Helena Marshall mm -hmm. uh, in Klaus Legevi's panel in the afternoon. So no, at no, least no, some um, perspective. The, the millennials uh, generation not taking a part is actually a very interesting and in important elephant in the room. And I will just um, uh, refer to this later. But... Um, okay, so, so the, the younger generations increasingly observed this quarrel and they thought, okay, so this is a quarrel in a family and they actually are quarreling about some kind of a heritage, who the Third Republic belongs to, eventually. And they didn't feel, or we didn't feel involved in the whole 
um, process of this quarrel. So, um, so this is why, why I say 1989 lasted for the longest time. The younger generations were uh, turning with their backs to, to politics and, um, and to civil engagement for a long time, but for a reason, because they couldn't fa have found any place for them in the mainstream. That's the truth. Um, now, and the year that this didn't exist, it didn't exist either because if you have a quarrel in the family about the history of the family, you don't put the history of the family in the public schools. Yes? So it's, it's, it's an interesting paradox that the history of the success of 1989 or the ambiguous success, let's say, of 1989 was never taught in Polish schools. Never. You would end up your education with 1945 when I was a child and also now. And I know that it's also in other post-communist countries. So this is an, an, a very important factor, I believe. Now, I don't want to be too pessimistic. I, I'm never, I'm never in, in, in favor of pessimism. So I would like to say something else to, to, to finish now. There, broadly speaking, there are two kinds of epochs. One kind of epoch is the epochs where people are living in very bad conditions under authoritarian or even totalitarian regimes. This causes their socialization to be a very specific one. They know how to cope with the situation. In Poland, it also has a local face in the meaning that we have lived for 200 years in an unsovereign state. This is also very, very important. It has shaped several uh, generations. But there are also other epochs when life is, so to say, well, easy. It, it just goes along. Yes. Um, you have democracy, you have sovereign state. People who grow up in such circumstances are different. Now, I do believe that the younger generations were um, reacting the, the, the best after 2015 in Poland. Why? Because the generation of 1968ers, their immediate response was, this is new communism. Okay, this is again Jaroslawski coming. This is again fascism. This is, we've seen it. We, we know that we've seen it, it's the same. Whereas the new generation said, no, it's, it's something completely new. You have, to, you have to look and listen, you have to observe. And they were very sure that they, being grown-ups created by democratic and sovereign states, that they actually feel powerful. So this is why the biggest, the best protests, the most um, creative protests, I will say, after, 1980, and, and after 2015, were actually organized, organized by the 20 plus and 30 plus people. So the, the black protest, for example, against the restriction of abortion laws, the, the candle protest uh, against the deformation of a judiciary system with, with candle, you've seen it all. You, you've, you've seen the, the, those protests in the media. You remember them because they were coming not from the fear that the history is going to repeat, but they were coming from a powerful statement that, okay, this is our country. We have to, we have to shape it the, the way we, want, we would like to, 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 it, it to look like. So this is, this is a very important intergenerational um, tension here. I would like to actually to know your opinion about it. I mean, I had an, uh, ich hatte auch diese Erfahrung, dass uh, ich hatte ja junge Studenten, uh, die uh, gar nicht mehr wussten, uh, was mit der DDR oder mit der Eisernen Vorhang oder mit Polen oder sogar Solidarność war. Und uh, sie tickten bereits ganz anders. Und ich hätte gerne mehr uh, davon erfahren und auch mehr davon abbekommen. Uh, für sie existierte beispielsweise diese Grenze nicht mehr. Sie bewegten sich äh, wie selbstverständlich, dann auch sprachlich äh, zwischen äh, meiner Universität und der Breslauer Universität. Äh, sie interessierten sich auch nicht so sehr für die Geschichte, äh, sondern sie wussten, wo die Clubs sind, äh, welche Bücher man liest, äh, was Olga Tukatschuk äh, schreibt und so weiter. Also ein, äh, das, was ich mit äh, Koselik meinte, ein anderer Erfahrungs Erfahrungshorizont und Erwartungshorizont. Sie dachten vorwärts, sie dachten, wie sie Karriere machen, sie dachten, wie sie nach Brüssel gehen und so weiter. 
Und das ist komplett verschieden, ich sage es von meinem Erfahrungshorizont. Ich bin ja ein Veteran. Ja? Und ich werde bis zum Ende meiner Tage auf meiner Mental Map wird immer bleiben, also Helmstedt, der Transitkorridor, die Mauer, die Kontrollen, das wird bis zum Ende meiner Tage so sein und, und so ist das. Und das kann man nicht durch pädagogische Maßnahmen, therapeutische Behandlung, das ist so. Wir leben mit diesen zwei Mental Maps äh, noch, äh, bis diese Generation verschwunden ist und es baut sich neu auf. Das muss man akzeptieren und das muss man nicht wegreden oder wegtherapeutisieren, äh, sondern äh, das austragen und ich meine, diese Feste jetzt sind ja auch ein Anlass und die ungeheure Welle von Publikationen. Es ist ja ein riesiges, jetzt was Deutschland angeht, ein riesiges innerdeutsches Palaver, dass wir uns endlich alles erzählen, was wir erlitten haben, was wir durchgemacht haben, was wir Tolles erlebt haben. Und solche großen Palaver, die haben etwas Gutes. Das sind Stufen sozusagen der, äh, eines normalen und normal werdenden Diskurses und der Auflösung von, äh, von Spannungen. Aber dieses, äh, die Koexistenz von verschiedenen Erfahrungshorizonten und Erwartungshorizonten, das, das ist sozusagen die Grundlage überhaupt der Pluralisierung von Interpretationen, von Geschichte, von, von Gesprächen und so weiter. Und noch eines, was ich sehr wichtig fand, ich war jetzt nicht zuletzt in Moskau bei diesen, bei diesen Demonstrationen, ich konnte das nur am Fernsehen verfolgen und über Erzählungen, was völlig klar ist, diese Leute, also oder sagen wir so, vor 10, 15 Jahren gab es die Befürchtung, dass diese Generation total entwurzelt, äh, überhaupt keine Ahnung mehr hat. Also da kennt man nicht mehr Lenin, Stalin, Trotzki, das ist alles Ancient History, das ist Antike, das ist weg. Äh, dass sie total depolitisiert und sozusagen nur noch auf den, das Moment der Gegenwart schauen. Also wie kommt man voran, wie geht man in die Welt hinaus, was kriegt man in dem nächsten Supermarkt? Also diese Gefahr bestand einer totalen Depolitisierung. Und jetzt muss man aber sehen, auf diesen Plätzen haben sich Leute versammelt, junge Leute, denen anzusehen ist, sozusagen physiognomisch, es ist eine Generation, die die Angst verloren hat. Sie ist sozusagen für, eine, für ein Regime, das auf Angst baut und mit Angst spielt und mit Einschüchterung spielt, ist sie, ich will nicht sagen, definitiv verloren, aber sie ist in einer Weise äh, auch nicht äh, total immun, aber sie, sie steht außerhalb also des Erfahrungszusammenhangs, den meine Generation dort äh, noch mitgemacht hat. Und das ist ein riesiges Potenzial. Und äh, ich sehe dort, äh, ich will das nicht jetzt, äh, ich nenne das die Hongkong-Erfahrung, äh, dass äh, an, in vielen Städten der Welt gibt es so etwas, eben nicht nur die virtuelle Öffentlichkeit, sondern es gibt wieder städtische Öffentlichkeiten, die sich auf die Hinterbeine stellen. Das waren die Demonstrationen in Breslau und in, in, in Warschau. Das war Moskau, das war Hongkong, das ist meinetwegen auch Santiago de Chile. Und also es gibt, also ich will da jetzt keine, keine Prognose machen, aber man merkt, dass die Gesellschaften doch lebendiger sind und nicht, äh, nicht so, dass äh, man sozusagen, was man leicht vergisst, wenn man auf die Strongmen, also auf die Autoritären immer nur guckt, es tut sich mehr. Ja? Und wir müssen in solchen Netzwerken herausfinden, und das ist natürlich eine irre Chance, wenn man 60, 80 von solchen kritischen Zeitschriften hat, an einem Ort sich darüber auszutauschen, also was ist los äh, auf, äh, on the ground? Ja? Und äh, das sozusagen ein Akkumulationsvorgang von, von Erfahrungen. Und, und also ich halte es nicht mit den Visionen, ja? sondern ich halte es mehr mit den Akkumulationen von, von Erfahrungen, äh, die ins Spiel äh, gebracht werden sollen. Now, let me just quickly mention something which you don't need to be reminded of, that this borderless experience is a very restricted one uh, up until today. So citizens of Serbia or whoever crossing the Serbian borders towards the uh, European Union or from Ukraine, 
for that matter, or even coming in from Turkey, still do experience that kind of border torture, the, which we fondly remember as shaping us, which, which I also remember as, as something that had shaped me. Uh, and I saw in, the, in my parents' eyes when cro crossing the former Iron Curtain for the first time last year, sitting on a train and not being stopped on their way to Vienna from Hungary. Um, so this is not that far. And, and your point is still valid, just so that we make sure that this is not such a privileged discussion that it never gets mentioned that it is a reality for a lot of people. But besides that, um, you mentioned, um, and I would like to ask Carolina to re react to this, and also to the audience to please raise your hands if you want to comment or question, because we're opening the floor, and I hope that we have help uh, to hand out the microphones after this. I would like to ask you about this, Carolina, though, which Mr. Schlöger has mentioned in his lecture. Um, referring to or, or elaborating on the thought that 89 started much, much earlier, and the forerunners, people like uh, Michnik and Bibo and others, uh, built up the language for it. And now we see uh, young people and all sorts of people, but also young people who were always desperate about young people, right? The, the upcoming generation, the then dominant generation, especially 30s and 40s, um, are always scared about how the youngsters know nothing and they're just, yeah, they're going to lose it entirely. Um, we don't share this pessimism. Uh, and we see them, among others, out there in the streets and being active. Is there someone shaping a language like this right now in repressive environments? or environments where, where advocacy is restricted? Or do we not need that anymore? So is this avant-garde thing still a thing? So I will refer for the second time now to the French Revolution, first with Charles Dickens, this now with Tocqueville, because this is, the, the, in his beautiful book, Ancient um, uh, Regime and, uh, um, uh, and Revolution, he, uh, he has this, this, this amazingly wise um, metaphor that revolution actually takes place before it actually starts. This is the idea of the crawling revolution. So the, 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 the revolution after 1789 uh, that you observe in, in France is actually uh, something that happens also already post-mortem of the ancient regime. So um, this is exactly what we could tell about many, many more revolutions. Yes, we could say the same actually about 1989. And I think you suggested it when you said that at, by 1989 there was no coherent um, Eastern Bloc, uh, for example. And now there is no coherent West. Yes, so th this is again, this is again the, the change that is now being, being shaped has actually been taking place for a longer time before. Um, but this brings me to, 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 to the intergenerational, because this is actually, the question you were asking is actually about the generations. Is, is it more like 1989 started much earlier, or is that we now are actually observing a death of something very particular? Namely, I would say, we are now observing the slow death of 1968. This is it. Because the, the most important definitions has been co have been all coined by the 1968ers. The, uh, the attitude towards the war, the attitude towards communism, um, the, the, uh, the, the most important goals of a sovereign state, all defined by the 1968ers. I think this is exactly why this is so painful, because this was, there has, this has been an extremely powerful generation. But, I will generalize now a, a lot, but this generation also, partly, has been uh, shaped by not democratic regimes. And thus, at least in, 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 in countries of Central Eastern Europe, um, it also has a, an authoritarian face. So having said that, 
Uh, I would just remind you about the book of Paul Lendwey about Viktor Orban, and when Paul Lendwey is looking for the sources of the Viktor Orban's change, he, mentioned, uh, he mentions humilia humiliation from the fathers, uh, founding fathers of the democratic Hungary. He, there is this wonderful anecdote when uh, Viktor Orban is, is uh, arriving to some debate and one of the older liberals is fixing his tie publicly. What a humiliation. So th there is something um, very um, reminding of, of, of authoritarian in the, in the way liberals, the 1968ers, can, uh, can, um, uh, can react to certain situations. And if you look at the, at the story of the law and justice, you also find out that this is actually a salon of the rejected. So this is extremely important. And now as for the, as for, as for the generation, um, finally, uh, Karl Schlögl said such, such, no, don't worry, such a question today, um, uttered such question today, what do the post-1908 generation has to offer? What does the post-1989 generation has to offer? I must admit, I was so um, shocked by this question or moved by this question that I, f I almost stood up. Why? Because this is a, 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 exactly the question that is being uttered and uttered and uttered in my homeland towards the new generations. Although they are extremely active, as I said, they are extremely active, yet they are active differently. They are active dif differently, they have a different energy, they have a different definition of what is political. And yet they are always being disciplined like this. I'm not saying that you are trying to do this because I have listened to your uh, keynote very, very precisely and I know that you're, uh, you're, you're completely not, not this, this, this type, type, of, type of person. So I'm just using the quotation to explain such, such uh, a, a certain phenomenon. This phenomenon, you might say it's connected with... Um, you might make an accusation of it and say this is a, about someone being authoritarian and not democratic, not listening enough, not open enough. But I would say something else. We haven't been talking about emotions much today, and I would just like to mention that what we are observing right now is also a time of great emotions and great passions. And this, I think, this, this need of the 68ers to find... Um, accomplices in political engagement, often this is not very nice, but they are still striving for having friends, yes, political friends. I think it's connected with a tremendous feeling of loss. Namely, there is a whole group of people that has been shaping the countries in Europe for decades, and now they have nothing to say anymore. Nothing to say. It's or a tremendous not, not feeling of loss. many are interested. I guess, so it also has to do with the audience. Would you like to react to this, or, or can we open the floor for questions? Yeah, I would like to see. Um, talking about this meine Frage war, ist, was hat diese Generation zu bieten im Sinne Wie bewältigt sie gedanklich, sprachlich, intellektuell, analytisch äh, die Situation? Äh, ich rechne mich, muss ich sagen, auch noch zu der 89er-Generation. Und die Frage, die ich mir stelle, ist, äh, wie kommen wir äh, klar äh, mit der Unübersichtlichkeit dieser neuen Lage und wie finden wir eine Sprache dafür? Und ich habe als Beispiel eine, eine Bewältigung habe ich die Generation davor, also die Hannah Arendt-Generation, die äh, Dissidenten der 60er, 70er Jahre genannt. Und ich stelle mir die Frage, äh, wie kommen wir eigentlich, how do we come to terms mit der neuen Situation? Und ich kann nur gestehen, äh, dass ich finde, äh, dass wir diese Sprache nicht haben. Also ich könnte Ihnen jetzt viele Beispiele angeben. 
Äh, also äh, die Herausforderung, die seitens Putins Russland besteht, ist nicht nur eine militärische, eine Machtfrage, sondern es ist eine intellektuelle Herausforderung. Und äh, ich finde nicht, dass wir äh, sozusagen in dieser Auseinandersetzung äh, bereits gerüstet sind und äh, angemessen antworten können. Ja, das ist aber die Voraussetzung, um sich selbst verteidigen zu können. Und äh, also die Grundfrage, die ich habe, äh, sind wir auf der Höhe der Zeit? Und da sehe ich eben Gefahren. Ich sehe eine Gefahr, äh, dass es viel bequemer ist, für unser Eins sich im Raum der Geschichte aufzuhalten. Ja, das kennen wir, das wissen wir, äh, damit haben wir uns lange beschäftigt. Es ist einfacher in einem intellektuellen Sinn und in einem moralischen Sinn sozusagen über der Vergangenheit, sozusagen über die Vergangenheit hinweg zu sein. Und die, das große Problem, und Bloch hat das eben un, un, unüberbietbar präzise benannt, wie kommt man mit der Gegenwart klar, also mit dem Dunkel des gelebten Augenblicks, ja? ohne Vision ohne auch die apokalyptischen Gewissheiten. Ja, es gibt ja im Augenblick so einen Hype von apokalyptischen äh, Gewissheiten. Ähm, jenseits dieser klaren Zukünfte ist die wirkliche Herausforderung die Gegenwart. Und ich sehe das nicht. Ich sehe ein Hin und Her von, von äh, sozusagen äh, zwei aufgestellten Fronten, die sich äh, gegenseitig was wir alles schon wissen, ja? äh, aber die, die Sprache, die der neuen Situation angemessen ist, bewegt sich irgendwo zwischen diesen alten Fronten. Ja? Und äh, sozusagen diese Chance einzugehen, äh, das meine ich mit Denken ohne Geländer, äh, die Beseitigung einer Kultur des Verdachts, in der nicht bestimmte Dinge besprochen werden können, äh, das ist, das ist ein großes Problem, die Schaffung einer Öffentlichkeit, die alle Risiken äh, des Denkens auf sich nimmt. Und äh, ich, sehe, ich sehe das nicht. Und ähm, die Verteidigung oder die Öffnung eines solchen Raums äh, ist nicht nur ein Problem von Orbans Ungarn oder in Polen, äh, sondern das ist auch ein Problem dieser so stabilen, reichen, pluralistischen Bundesrepublik. Darf ich nur antworten, sehr kurz? Ja, ich weiß jetzt nicht mehr, welche Sprache ich spreche, aber äh, also ich wollte nur sagen, dass, dass ich, mir hat besonders gefällt, dass, dass ähm, das Begriff Coming to Terms, ich, ich denke eigentlich, das ist jetzt die Zeit für Aussöhnung und dass die, die verschiedenen Gruppen haben sehr unterschiedliche Verlustgefühle. Die Liberalen, sagen wir ja jetzt sehr allgemein, die haben das Verlustgefühl, das ich früher, worüber ich früher ge gesprochen habe. Aber auch Verlustgefühl, würde ich sagen, ist das Gefühl, das ist die Ursache des Populismus. Nämlich, dass die demokratischen Transformationen waren nicht nur guter Wandel, sondern auch eigentlich Schleudern, wie die Deutschen sagen. Ja? Ein Schock, Schleudern dass die Leute Beziehungen, alte Freundschaften, die, ähm, äh, die, die, die alte Weisen, in deren man bestimmte Sachen macht, die, das, das, das ist alles verloren. Und, und, ja, und das, das ist vielleicht die, die Ursache dieser, äh, die, dieser, dieser ganzen großen Wandel. Und deshalb spreche ich über die Aussöhnung. Hm. Speaking of a new language, let us open the floor for questions, not uh, excluding the possibility to, uh, to for you to uh, continue this dialogue. We had a couple of hands raised. Do we have someone who has already acquired a microphone? Oh, hi. Wir haben leider nur momentan ein Mikrofon, deswegen dauert es ein bisschen länger, bis ich durchgehe. Um, but I would just say you call the people, so, okay. I, I think this gentleman first, 
So, <laughs> do I have to switch it on or is it on already? It's on it. So I have two questions. Main question would be, like for revolutions in general, talking now about revolutions in Eastern Germany, 89, 90. So isn't there a similar scheme, a similar path they're always, always following? I think all these revolutions, talking now about Eastern European revolutions, they start with a revolution, an uprising against something, against a dictator, a system. The Soviet, let, let's give the example of, of the Ukraine here, against Jaroszewski, let's say, for the uh, demonstration on uh, Maidan national nationality, uh, the Euromedan. Um, so that, that's the easy, easy way. Everyone is against Jaroszewski. Um, uh, uh, sorry, I always mistake them. Yanukovsky, sorry, uh, Yanukovych. So the point is that after you win your battle on the streets, whatever, um, then you realize that you had totally different ideas about the future then. There was, the, let's say this example here, the Ukraine. There was the right sector involved that had totally different ideas, like there were people that were totally left, they're even dreaming about a democratic socialist or even communist system. Um, a liberal socialist system there were people that only wanted to join the European Union or wanted to be part of Europe, wanted to travel freely. They have totally different ideas. So it's easy to unite against something in, in such revolutions. And I think you can, I don't, I don't want to talk too much here, but you can see it in many, many revolutions. In Eastern Europe, and revolutions I would see, even say, say in general. So isn't, the, isn't this the point really, that, that it's easy to fight against something, to unite against something, a system, a dictator, a person, political person, whatever, and then comes the point that you have to find out what you really want to change it in which way, and, and what is the future of your country. And to say, I make it short now, the second question, very short, is um, I like the narrative that you can actually um, like interpret um, a change, a revolution, just from bottom top or, or um, from top down. So are revolutions just driven by some, some, some uh, popular political figures? either from, um, from, from uh, civil society or politicians or whatever, or are they driven by the people? And how is the, the interaction with this? Martin Brabant, ich habe eine äh, Anmerkung äh, zu dem Thema äh, heute ähm, und auch zu dem, was Herr Sch äh, Schlögel äh, die Mindmaps genannt hat. Und ich meine, dass es doch einen erheblichen Unterschied zwischen der sort of general mind map in the West äh, compared to the general mind map in the East, äh, meaning äh, Eastern Europe, äh, gibt äh, und die drückt sich im Westen äh, mit dem Begriff, das war die Zeit des Kalten Krieges aus, so schön neutral und für mich wird damit die, äh, der Kern des ganzen Problems des Kalten Krieges verharmlost, indem die äh, Besetzung, die Unterdrückung Osteuropas durch dieses äh, sowjetisch-kommunistische Imperium eigentlich hinten rangestellt wird. Es wird nur, wenn Sie mit Schülern heute reden und über die Zeit reden, dann kommt zuerst, ja, das war die Zeit des Kalten Krieges. Aber es kommt fast nichts dazu, wie, wie, wie sich das ausgewirkt hat, was für Diktaturen, wie die Leute unterdrückt wurden in der ganzen Zeit. Und wenn ich dann 40 Jahre in einer Diktatur gelebt habe oder in Russland noch länger, dann... Ja, weiß ich gar nicht, wie Sie gerade sagten. Wie soll denn das neue Leben gestaltet werden? Und ich kann dann eigentlich gar nicht erwarten, dass eine Bewegung, die gar keine Führung hat, die nur dagegen ist, Konzepte auf den Tisch legt. Aber das Problem des Kalten Krieges, finde ich, verharmlost diesen massiven Unterschied, den Kern der Geschichte. Thank you. Let me first of all say thank you for having me here. I feel a slightly lone Brit in this distinguished assembly, but I do have some questions. I do have some questions. You're not Brit. I do have some questions. Um, 
Dr. Schlegel, you said something about Fukuyama. I th I'm sorry, can't you hear me? Fukuyama, um, the end of history is his famous quote. Did you mean he's the end of history is returning or Fukuyama would get a second chance? Um, I'm sort of interested. And, and the other thing, um, Dr. Um, Vigura, you said the young people, I have grandchildren of 24 and, and so, young people are on the streets because they have lost their fear. No, absolutely not. I feel that they have lost faith in their politicians. There is no recourse other than to go to the streets from Hong Kong to, to, to Iraq. There was a demonstration in Berlin yesterday by Iraqis, two or three hundred people, not a lot. And what they were asking was, Europe, please help. We have a new election. We want it without corruption, and we want it for all Iraqis. I was very moved that they were asking Europe to help. Thank you so much for having me. Just very quickly, Judith, you're not alone. At least Simon Garnet is here. He's also still a Brit. <laughs> you're not entirely alone with that, although he has, he's multifaceted in that regard. Um, just to maybe go a bit in order uh, and to say, this is a talking point that comes up very often, that it's easy to mobilize against something. But I think really it is more the, the question of strategic alliances and how much they last. It's, it's a bit less methodology of mobilization in a sense. And this is something Carolina has already uh, mentioned. Do you want to react to this? No, I just wanted to, to react to... Uh, to the part connected with whether re revolution is going from the up or from down. Y you Perhaps you, you read the beautiful essay by George Orwell, Orwell, which is called Killing an Elephant. So for all of you that haven't read it, it's, a, it's an essay about, well, Orwell himself. He's in Burma. He is um, a, a representative of the colonial um, uh, Great Britain. And thus, he's the only ha person in town who has a rifle. Um, he is called by the by the inhabitants of the of the town because an aggressive elephant uh, has appeared and is killing people. And 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 Orwell goes gradually goes 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 uh, to to the in the direction of the animal. And in the end, he doesn't know anymore whether it's him who is approaching the animal because he has the means to kill it, or it's the people behind him gathering who are actually pushing him to do it. There is actually a, a, a quite a startling uh, sentence at the very end when he explains why he actually killed the animal. He says, because I didn't want to look stupid. Is it, it thought-provoking um, for, for us and for asking who causes the revolution, actually? Um, and I just wanted to say one remark about emotions. Um, it might be that it's very easy to unite against something, but Europe also has this, this important story connected with emotions, namely both the changes that were um, undergone af after 1945 and to a large extent the changes after 1989 were connected with a particular fear which, is, which, is, which was the fear of the past. We were all afraid of the past. We were afraid of the totalitarianisms, both of them, of the war, of police state, etc., etc. And with time, such emotions can also um, disappear. It's, it's coming with the generational change. It's coming with the time, simply. And I think an important change today is that the, not the emotion is changed, but the vector of the emotion. Today, we are afraid of the future and not of the, of the past. We are afraid of the future, many different kinds of fear of the future. Like, for example, some people who vote for law and justice are terribly afraid that the Muslims that will come to Europe will destroy its civilization. 
Some people are extremely worried that the democracy will end. That's it. End of it. Yeah? Some people are very much afraid that in 12 years, the planet will actually decide to kill us all. So I don't now say which of those fears is more legitimate. I'm just saying that it seems that the fe fear of the future is a dominant emotion playing politics right now. Ja, ich kann mich in vielem anschließen, äh, aber zu der Einfachheit äh, sozusagen gegen einen Gegner äh, sich zu formieren. Äh, man muss dazu sagen, es bedarf einer sehr langen Inkubationszeit, um diese Kräfte zu generieren. Äh, da stehen ganze Schübe dahinter, negative Erfahrungen im Ostblock, der Aufstand 53 die Aufstände 56 in Budapest, in Posnan, die Erfahrung von 86 in Prag. Also es brauchte sehr lange, bis sich die Kräfte gefunden hatten, intellektuell, organisatorisch, die, die dann den Job gemacht haben. Und die Mühen der Ebene danach, ja, das sind große Mühen und man kann nur hoffen, dass das institutionelle, der institutionelle Rahmen existiert, sozusagen für den Wettbewerb um die Best Practices, wie man es machen soll. Aber es gibt eine, auch eine lange Vorgeschichte. Dann, ich finde diese, in Deutschland jedenfalls die Diskussion gewissermaßen um die Definitionshoheit, wer hat eigentlich die Wende herbeigeführt, sind es die Massen, die über den Ring in, in Leipzig geströmt sind oder waren es die kleinen dissidentischen äh, Gruppierungen. Äh, ich finde diesen Streit äh, obsolet und äh, unhistorisch, weil es vollständig klar ist, äh, dass ohne die lange Arbeit, äh, die Wühlarbeit, die Zersetzungsarbeit, die Aufklärungsarbeit, die Sprachfindungsarbeit diese vereinzelten Gruppierungen hätte es das nicht gegeben. Und diese Dialektik zwischen dem Mut, der Intelligenz der Einzelnen, die sich gefunden haben und der Masse, die dann mitzieht, das muss man einfach erzählen. Das ist kein Gegenstand für Rechthaberei. Und ich fand diese Kontroverse, die da ausgetragen wurde, zum, zum Teil ganz überflüssig. Cold War, ähm, äh, es ist wahr, äh, dass äh, dieser Begriff oder diese äh, Ikone äh, dazu verführt, äh, diese Prozesse zu, wie soll ich sagen, zu übersehen. Äh, aber für uns, jedenfalls im Westen, äh, machten wir doch die Erfahrung, und ich bin im Schatten dieses Kalten Krieges aufgewachsen, dass es so etwas wie eine Sichtblende war. Es war eine Erziehung zum dichotomischen, antagonistischen Denken, zum Entweder-Oder. Während es eigentlich darauf ankam, also für mich, so habe ich das empfunden, wer hinüberging und sich umsah, der sah etwas mehr als den Ostblock. Ja, da war etwas mehr. Das war heterogen, das war vielschichtig, das war atemberaubend. Und äh, sich diese... Erfahrung zu erschließen, jenseits dieser dichotomischen, simplifizierenden äh, Geschichte der Teilung, äh, das war sehr wichtig, aber Sie haben natürlich recht, äh, dass sozusagen die, die Prozesse selber damit äh, auch zum Verschwinden gebracht werden konnten. Letzte Bemerkung zu Fukuyama. Als ich Fukuyama gelesen habe, sozusagen mitten äh, sozusagen im Sturm des Orkans, äh, ich habe das äh, gelesen und ich konnte nur vielleicht nicht lachen, aber ich dachte, der ist weit weg, der, der hat überhaupt nichts kapiert. Ich habe ihn, wie soll ich sagen, auf eine, wie soll ich sagen, simple, wenn ich zu sagen vulgäre Weise, spöttisch behandelt. In Wahrheit ist es aber so, und ich denke, wir sollten ihn alle noch mal lesen. Vielleicht sogar ist das Buch wichtiger als das Neue über Identity und so weiter, wo er versucht, sozusagen auf der Höhe der Zeit zu bleiben. Ich finde, dass dieses Buch tatsächlich etwas zum Ausdruck gebracht hat. 
nämlich, dass uns nichts Besseres bisher einfällt, als die sogenannte liberale, demokratische Ordnung, dass es kein überbotenes Beispiel für eine Lebensform gibt, die uns und vielen anderen zusagt. Das bedeutet nicht, dass es nicht, lieber, äh, nicht rivalisierende Systeme, Alternativen gibt, die auch ihre Überzeugungskraft entfalten können, siehe die atemberaubende Entwicklung in China mit allem, was dazugehört. Aber Fukuyama hat eigentlich nichts anderes gemacht, und zwar in Anknüpfung an einen Eltern, Alexander Kozhev, alias Alexander Kozhevnikov, als zu sagen, dass wir uns eine Welt über, diese, sozusagen über diesen erreichten Punkt hinaus nicht gut denken können. Was er nicht bedacht hat, und darüber müssen wir jetzt nachdenken, nämlich, dass es zu einer Infragestellung nicht durch eine Alternative, die chinesische oder die russische, sondern durch, zu einer Infragestellung äh, dieses Punktes durch uns selbst gekommen ist. The self-destruction of the West, the self-destruction of the United States. Das ist der Punkt. Und dass wir uns nicht darauf verlassen können, dass es automatisch einfach dabei bleibt, sondern es kann einstürzen, es kann zu Ende sein. Und wir können wieder an einen Punkt landen, der 1914 war oder 1933, sozusagen die, das Wachwerden dafür, dass alles möglich ist und dass es keine Garantien gibt, das steht eigentlich an. Ich sehe aber keinen Grund, die, wie sagt man, die Nase zu rümpfen über Fukuyamas Buch vom Ende der Geschichte. Es gibt keinen überbotenen Punkt, eine über einer überbietenden Lebensform äh, als die, die er beschrieben hat und die vor ihm äh, Kozhev äh, schon beschrieben hat. Ja, vielen Dank. Ähm, ich würde gerne Ihr Augenmerk noch mal auf die südöstliche europäische äh, Linie richten. Wir haben uns ja, oder Sie haben ja mal, äh, überwiegend über Russland und Mittelosteuropa gesprochen. Nun hat es ja ein Modell gegeben, das viele Merkmale ähm, der osteuropäischen Länder gar nicht kannte, Jugoslawien. Es gab Reisefreiheit, sie konnten einkaufen gehen. Sie hatten den besten Pass der Welt, wie die Jugoslawen sagten. Die titischen Reformen haben immer auf der Verfassungsebene versucht, das Problem der Republiken zu balancieren. Sie haben Leute aus der Partei ausgeschlossen, die sehr nationalistisch früh agiert haben. Trotzdem ist das Land an Self-Destruction zerfallen aufgrund des ethnischen Hasses und der Nationalismen. Und meine Frage ist, wir haben heute, glaube ich, zu beobachten, dass es in bestimmten Ländern Mittelosteuropas eine Wiedergeburt dieser emotionalen Haltung gibt. Wie interpretieren Sie diese rasante Veränderung, so haben Sie das, glaube ich, vorhin genannt, Herr Schlöge, dass etwas wieder ins Leben gekommen ist, dass man im jugoslawischen Fall wirklich versucht hat, politisch zu balancieren. Es ist nicht gelungen. Uh, well, thank you. I think that maybe coming, it, it's coming from a Swedish point of view, uh, not having to do anything with the Balkans, but maybe my question still has something to do with the former. I, I wanted to say that I was listening very much to, to Professor Schlögel when you've been using Koselex, this, uh, um, uh, the horizon of expectations. And, and uh, uh, I wondered what you think, and I'm as interested of what you other in the panel think about the nation state as the arena for those uh, for the horizon of expectations etc we're having a very international uh, conversation here which i think of course is good but i think it's politically interesting to think about that thank you I cannot give an explanation to the fall of Yugoslavia, but um, I think that 
it is possible everywhere and that there's no guarantee that countries, societies will not fall back into uh, unseen atrocities. And I believe this because every generation is starting from anew. They have experiences in their memories, but in fact, the deciding point is how they will act under conditions of crisis, stress, disorder, chaos, uh, struggle of the fittest for survival. So even for a well-ordered society as Germany, uh, there is no guarantee. And I mean, years ago, we could not imagine that there would be demonstrations, people calling. Uh, it, was, uh, it was unbelievable, but we have to realize that every, yes, I would say, generation has to prove itself, and there will be uh, uh, proofs and exercises, and we have no guarantee. We have no guarantee, and I do not share the belief of people who think that knowing the history, you are sure not to reiterate mistakes and errors. I can't give you an, an answer uh, for Yugoslavia. Uh, uh, I mean, there are certain historical conditions uh, why in this unique place, Yugos Yugoslavia in the Cold War time, had no chance after the falling apart of the two hemispheres. Uh, so, uh, second to the to the nation, uh, I'm convinced that for a long future still the nation state is relevant, is working, is the form of the organization of um, political and communal life. Of course, under the stresses and under the impact of globalization processes, and the nation state has to be adapting and has to be uh, transformed but the nation state will be, will work for quite a long time. And I do not believe that there will be an all European uh, nation. Uh, it, it's, it will be rather a kind of federation or Staatenbund, uh, which has to come to terms and to find a way to navigate on the new global scenario. But, to defend the nation state and even the borders of the nation state is for, in my view, not a sign of nationalism. Nationalism in the sense of right wing. I basically would like to react to the question about nationalism um, awakening uh, in, in Central and Eastern European countries. Um, you know, in Peloponnesian work, Thucydides uh, describes two kinds of, um, two phases of Athenian society. First, you have the funeral speech of Pericles, where Pericles is, um, is, is talking about Athenians as people who respect the law, they respect each other, and basically the, the strong community uh, that they create is, 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 um, is built on the fundament of the you might say, you might interpret it this way, of, on, the, on the fear of the law. Just a couple of pages later, uh, there is another um, portrayal of uh, Athenian society under the black. So there is this horrible disease that has um, appeared in Athens, and everybody who has contact with, uh, with a sick person will die. So he says, the best the best people die because they care for the sick and they, they die 100%. But, but the, the, the worst people just isolate themselves and they are horribly frightened of death. And this changes everything. The community is, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, falling apart. The rule of law is not there anymore. And the whole, the whole community is, is different because the passion is different. The passion is different. So I think politics is about not only responding to emotions and passions, but also to, about creating them. And good politics is about creating better emotions. 
those fears that you mentioned, the nationalist fear, the fear of the refugees uh, in my own country, uh, they have been created. They have been created by certain politicians. If you look in the opinion polls, what did the Polish people say about Muslims and refugees in 2012, 13, 14? Perhaps 5% would say, oh, you know, we don't like them. After 2015, 30%, 40%, 50%. 50%. So you, you can create fears. It, it doesn't make them not, not, not dangerous. I think it's extremely dangerous. But it gives a ray of hope because if a fear has been created, it also can be alleviated. You can create another emotion. And this is, I think, an extremely important part because this will be my ending remark, really. Because, you know, what is it about this whole 1989? It's about hope. Those people on the bazaars, uh, they would never go out there with, uh, I don't know, books or socks or what they were selling, uh, trying to make their living if they didn't have hope. So, um, so it's important now that when we, when we observe the ambiguous results of 1989 as a process to remember that, that there is still hope and it, it can all be still changed. And this is the point we can start the change. Thank you very much. This is more or less the time we had. Uh, for all those who wonder further, uh, if you have an answer to Yugoslavia, tell us during lunch. If you want to read up on it, I even more so advise to check out the 89 focal point of Eurozine by the title, The Legacy of Division. You may be interested to read Florian Bieber's article by the title, Anxious Europe especially delving into this problem once nation states and mobility come to the question, you may be tempted to read Yanis Panayotis' uh, uh, article on the freedom of movement. And more importantly, even more importantly, Philip Ter is back in the headline and is coming in the afternoon. And I think he's going to have an issue to raise with Karl Slugel point about the Chicago school having less of an influence than usually attributed. I'm looking forward to you guys discussing this, possibly. Thank you so much. Enjoy your lunch and let's be back with us. <laughs>